All right, I think we are good to go. Let's do this. All right. Hi, I'm Tom Marks, and I talk about code. Today, we're going to be doing more PlayStation 2 homebrew development. Uh, I did some work off camera, okay? So let's let's have a quick look at where we are. I've ported a bunch of logic across from my Lisp game jam entry. So where we left off, uh, where we left off, sorry, I've just got to rearrange my things a little. Where we left off uh, last stream, we had this menu working, which is cool. But I've gone a little bit further and added a basic game room. Uh, now, you can move a player entity around. I just added this nice simple test entity that goes around in a circle around like some central point. Um, these are tiles drawn on a tile map. Again, no actual sprites yet. Uh, all the logic is there for it, I just haven't actually gotten around to working out how to load the textures yet. Um, so this stuff all works, but I've actually ported something across that was in my code base, but didn't actually make it into my final game. Um, and that is that there is more than one room here. So in my final Lisp Game Jam game, you know, it's kind of like wave survival in one room, enemies come in from all directions. But the original idea was to move through a dungeon uh, with multiple rooms, and so I've implemented that. You can move to another room. Mind-blowing, right? Like, this is this is the technology that we have access to uh, in 2021. But uh, if you go to a room, so for example, there are only two rooms in this uh, in this dungeon, right? There's this room and there's the room over off-screen to the right. If we go to the left, uh, the game will crash, which isn't good. <laughs> so I don't know if the ultimate solution to that will be that you'll always just, like, kind of box everything in by default and only open up passages between rooms uh, if there is actually somewhere to move. I don't know. That That's a question for not right now. Um, it does actually tell us, right? Could not find room at a certain position. So let, let's just have a quick look at the Lua code that's powering this. Um, the important bit is the actual room abstraction. The room has some bounds that, uh, you know, kind of constrain where it is. It has a bunch of tiles. And eventually it'll have a function that gets called when you enter a room. This will do things like spawn enemies, uh, kind of keep track of room state. I think it's really cool to make this a function rather than, uh, you know, rather than anything else. Uh, sorry, just fiddling. Oh, I cannot see my chat. I can see my chat. Okay, there we go. Perfect, perfect. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's better to have these things represented as functions rather than having some, like, arbitrary structure. Eventually we can build functions from some, you know, list of entities that should be in the room, but make them functions. It's easy to prototype with, it's easy to compose bits together, whatever, and then when we need to load things from files, we can we can write a loader to do it. But while we're prototyping, having everything just be functions is nice. Uh, nice and simple to work with. Uh, also, thank you to uh, Hugo uh, some follows from while I was off camera, Hugo Stoso96 and uh, Henri, uh, Henri Care Garcia, and that may be French. <laughs> I will not subject you to my terrible French accent any more than uh, I did just then. But yeah, so we've got a room that does a few things. We can test if a point is inside of a room. That's how we decide where the camera should focus. Um, we can set and get tiles in a room. And then we just have, you know, a, kind of, a bit of the glue code and, and the actual logic to draw a tile. This is going to have to be extended at some point. Again, I've, I've got some ideas about how we can do fancy tile drawing in a way that uh, lets us get more uh, from a simple tile map because we're very constrained in terms of VRAM when it comes to textures. Uh, we also have... We also have a game state defined, which is kind of what's driving things here. Um, Again, we kind of got an update loop. It's going to update each of the entities in our room. Uh, the entity is being stored in a list called eList. I don't know why I didn't call this entity list. Uh, this is the only time in this entire code base so far I've used this kind of like short name. So that's probably, probably not the best. But, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to make life hard for yourself. Uh, again, similar to my Lisp code, I'm using the idea of uh, having a table full of colliders. So if an entity can collide with things, it puts a collider in a table, and a collider again is just a function. So then uh, for each entity, we check it against each collider, right? And this means that, you know, maybe we have like five or six entities uh, in, our, in our game state, but only one or two of them collide with things. So that means we only check pairs uh, like colliders against entities that make sense. I I think this stops uh, this check kind of going to n squared, but I don't know, it's a small thing. Mostly I like it because it 
uh, kind of decouples this from the update step a bit. It means that our collider, again, is just a function. We're just writing code. We're not doing, like, some complicated... Well, I mean, we are, but we're masking it all on the fact that it's a function. I don't know. And functions compose really well, and that is probably the most important thing that I care about when it comes to this kind of thing. Uh, so hopefully in this stream we'll get to see why this pattern, I think, is really, really useful. Um, and while we're looking through our entities, we also try and keep track of the entity that uh, we believe we're supposed to be focusing on. This is crude at the moment. It's done by just like a string. Uh, every entity has like an entity type string and we give the room a focus type string. So for example, our player entity has the type player. We tell the room over in main, over in main.lua uh, that we want to focus on start game. What's start? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We tell the room that we want to focus on. Uh, we tell the room that we... Maybe we don't tell the room that we want to focus on a player. That sounded that sounded good in my head. Um, <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Maybe I just hard-coded this to player. Did I hard... Yeah, I just hard-coded this to player. Um, which is also fine. It means that we can point the camera at other things if we need to, but we may never need to. The system is flexible, but it, it doesn't... It's not uh, flexible in a way that introduced more complexity. We may never actually use it, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time like rigging up complicated machinery. Um, here's a cool thing. So we have our player character. And our player character is defined as a class. So if we go into our entities uh, file, and this is actually more... This is a similar idea to what was in my Lisp Game Jam game, but a little bit more refined. We have this one uh, base table for an entity. When you define a new entity type, it makes a copy of this table you will give it, you know, a couple of other things, like you'll give it a different e-type, you'll give it a different update function, if it draws anything you'll give it a different draw function, uh, but anything you don't give it will be overridden by this default entity table, and then that will become, uh, so it's like a copy of this with some changes, and that becomes uh, the index of the meta table when you make an instance, right? So, like this. Um, and then things get merged in. So, it's kind of interesting, right? Um, you also give it this args object. So when you make a new instance, for example, we make a player, we set x, we set y, this is like overriding the meta table. So again, um, we're just using Lua concepts in a very, very simple way to give ourselves a powerful entity system that's not extremely powerful. We can't make subclasses, we can't, you know, share behaviors uh, very easily, apart from the fact that we can share update and draw functions, right? So that's kind of important. But um, yeah, on the whole, very, very simple. Uh, we're just using straight Lua concepts and it's giving us flexibility, but we're not getting, you know, maximum flexibility. We're getting flexibility within the scope of what we're building and that hopefully will be all we need. Uh, we're not, you know, adding a lot of complexity to get this flexibility. This flexibility is, is just us appreciating what's already in Lua. So today I want to go into our player uh, player.lua. Okay, I'm going to start deleting these panel files soon. Uh, I want to get our player pretty much back up to where it was uh, in the Lisp game jam. That means that we need to... Well, I mean, we're pretty much already there, right? Um, we just pretty much need to add our attack back in. Uh, and so that means that when we're pressing... We can basically do this here, right? Um, else if... Else if... ev key equals pad x then uh, and now here is here is the interesting thing and here's something I actually want to refactor here um, this player movement is very very simple in my Lisp version of this I kind of split out the idea of what buttons are being held uh, and how is this converted into movement uh, so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna do the same thing here let's actually let's start with this let's start with this let's also just double check um, get Okay, we've actually got a bit of a git diff on the fly, so we're gonna uh, So what's this? This is room focusing. Yeah. Room focus fix. Uh hold on. Okay, this is uh, 
this is a bad big commit. Yeah. Uh, add entity system room tile draw fixed uh, room focus plus camera. That's a terrible commit message. Message as a terribly large commit. Do not do what Donny don't does. Okay, so rather than having a dy and a dx, I'm actually going to change this. I mean, we we still want a dy and a dx, but we're not gonna we're not gonna think about them here. We're gonna have a local impulse, and this is gonna be. Oh, is this is this too ambitious? Do I want uh, do I want this to be a vector? Okay, now that's an interesting thought, right? So let's let's. Let's let's imagine a maths library, okay? This maths library does not exist yet. We're gonna write this, but uh, let's say v is v. We make a two-dimensional vector. <clears throat> Excuse me. God, my hair is really out of control at the back, isn't it? Uh, and the beard is getting ridiculous. Um, I am destined to visit the barber soon. Soon. Okay. If pad left is pressed, then impulse dot x equals negative one. If pad right, then impulse dot x equals one. If pad dot up, Im impulse dot y equals negative one. And here, impulse dot y equals one. Um, the, I, I guess impulse dot x plus one. Uh, the, this, let's do this because then we end up, so, you know, if we're pressing left, we go to the left, but if we press right, as l if we're already going to, like, impulse x is negative 1, then this cancels out to 0, otherwise we go to the right. Um, this is... I think this is just a slightly more flexible, natural feeling way of handling this, otherwise right and down will always have priority in our movement, uh, and that is definitely not, like, natural, I guess. So. We've mapped, uh, and then no, the the other thing we want to do. Um, else, if ev dot key equals, I should let, let's do movement first. Let's do movement first. That's what I said. Okay, so local dx equals zero. Actually, I don't think we need this. Let's say, let's say local uh, ground. Let's uh, local deer. Local move equals impulse dot dot scale so we normalize uh so that we don't move faster if we're holding left and right right because the square root of two is the diagonal of a square um we normalize it and then we scale it by our walking speed does that work and like we could define uh meta table the eh, eh, i'm not super fussed about that i've not really done it before um scale by our walking speed. Uh, and then we multiply that. So do we multiply by dt here? Yeah, so this is our speed, and then down here we say self x uh, plus move.x times dt. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this is a speed. This is a, a speed vector. Um, which gets multiplied by the amount of time that's passed in the frame. We move this many uh, so move.x pixels per second, uh, which is why this number looks big, right? 100 pixels per second actually isn't that fast, um, because yeah, dt is in, in fractions of a second. Okay, perfect, perfect. So now we just need to implement that. Um, vector, we have a vector.fanel, we don't have a vector, and this is actually a different vector API entirely. Uh, script vector.lua. Okay, so we had a vec2, uh, so it's x equals 0, y equals 0. Uh, we had a, we had, let's do it down here, function vec2 normalize. Can I put a star in a name like that? I don't think I can, hey. Um, And that's that's not how you do. Okay, 
So uh, the, the big question when you're implementing this kind of vector logic, uh, especially in a language like Lua, uh, do I modify this vector in place or do I return a copy of the vector? And I think in this case, I just modify in place because it's simpler. And when it becomes a problem, then I'll uh, deal with copies and stuff. So let's go normalize. Uh, what do I do? I do, uh, well, let, let's make a length function as well. Function vec to length. Uh, so return math dot script uh, x times x plus y times y. Yep, yep, and then we re uh, we say self dot self dot. Got to remember our self dots. Cool. Self dot x equals look local len equals self dot length. Uh, we divide x by length, and then we say. Perfect. And then vec to scale s dot x. Um, and I mean, actually, we can rewrite this in terms of like uh, self dot scale self scale one over len. I guess I don't know if that's actually nicer. Um, I guess we could also do this in one operation if we just got the length and then multiplied it by what we were going to scale by and then just called vector scale. Again, this is all premature optimization. Okay, I need to I need to calm down and and just smash out some vectors here. So self dot x times s, and then we do the same search and replace for y, uh, and we return self. I guess just in case we like want something. This was cleaner in Lua. This was cleaner in Lua. My um. Uh, this was cleaner in Lisp, sorry. Let's just have a quick peek at my vector version of this, right? I really like this API uh, because I had a normalized version that mutated, that I notated with the star, and then I had a version that copied, but the copy version may just like called the dumb copy function and then called the mutate version of normalize on it, um, which I, like, the same, I think it's maybe easier to see with scale. Uh, so scale mutate sets these fields, but scale copy makes a copy and then calls scale mutate. Mwah. Beautiful. So clean. So simple. I love that. That really made me happy. Apart from the fact that I was like calling set and actually doing mutation uh, in Lisp, but it made me happy. So you have to be practical at a certain point, right? Okay, so player. Uh, what are we expecting? We are expecting... What are we expecting? We want a function vec2, which is like our constructor. So let's say function vec2... Let's say function... Let's say... So vec2 is the index of our meta table. We need a function, so return vec2 equals function x, y, that. Uh, so local v. So we want to create a new uh, a new object with that meta table set. Right, so our meta table is going to be index equals vec2. Okay, then v.x equals x, v.y equals y, and we return v. I think it's that simple. And then we can add more, you know, kind of like constructors to this as we go. If we add like a vector 3, for example, if we want to get crazy and move into the third dimension, I don't know if that's going to be. Uh, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think this is good for now, right? Or maybe like a vec2i, like an integer version. And maybe eventually, rather than having an actual Lua version of this, maybe we actually just have a C implementation of this and give it a Lua API. That's probably like the end goal for a lot of this stuff, especially, uh, you know, I love to show it, but gif.lua. Um, horrible bit manipulation in Lua, a language which has no bit manipulation, so you end up doing stuff like this. Um, this 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 stuff's got to be ported to C eventually, right? Otherwise, our performance will continue to be garbage. But as a learning tool and as an experimentation tool, this is so nice. This is so nice. Um, so, so nice. Okay. So this should be good. Um, what happens if I run? And actually, let's run... Let's run in the Love2D wrapper, okay? 
I form, formal, normal, uh, normalized a new value. Okay, let's go back to our vector code. Normalize. Did I call it normalized? I call it. I called it normalized. Let's call it normalize. We're we're normalizing. We're not normalized. Um, also, let's actually make Lua lint. I need to get in the habit of doing this more. Just make sure that it lints before I even try and run anything. Uh, how are we going? Attempted to index local self a nil value. That is because I'm not calling these as methods. Okay. And yeah, it's important that I actually, in my normalized call, return self, because that means that we can then chain these together into, like, beautiful soups of, uh, of linked operations. Okay, so what happens when I run? Attempted to index vector 8, line 8, length. That is because I'm not abiding by my own rule. Okay. Uh, could not find room for nan nan. Interesting. This is different. Um, so what this probably means is one over, if our length is zero. Okay, so what this means is, right, when we uh, look at our player, the first thing that happens when our game starts, our player updates, our update happens before we draw our first frame. So the first update happens, okay? We're not holding any buttons. So impulse X is zero, impulse Y is zero. Then we call this normalize function. We look in vector, right? Well, it gets the length, the length is zero. And then we do this. No, 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 this doesn't fly. So uh, do we need do we need to check this? Maybe we actually check this in player. Yeah, okay, so local uh, move mag, move mag, move len. Because this is actually going to be useful to have anyway. Impulse, uh, impulse length. If move len greater than zero, zero point one. Let's say zero. Um, we could also like put a, a kind of a lower floor on this. I mean, we are putting a lower floor on this. We're saying that you know, if if uh, any movement greater than zero is a move. You could say like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, if you're taking uh, analog stick input, if you're taking, if you're taking analog stick input, you might want to say, you know, if it's less than like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, don't count that as movement. Cause that's probably someone just like, just like breathing on the stick in, in a slightly wrong way, right? Like just moving it a little bit. Um, Man, I'm really proud of that use of a prop. I need to get uh, more in the habit of that kind of thing. So, if we have a move length, then do some stuff. Otherwise, we're actually not too concerned. Um, if we're not moving, I don't know. Um, we're we're going to make this a little bit smarter soon, but for now, this is good. So, uh, rather than calling normalize now, we can actually simplify things because we can just divide. Uh, we can just divide our walk speed by the length this this normalizes right because this is like multiplying by one on move length times the walk speed this is just combining them both into one nice simple scale operation so when i run this nothing will go wrong and there you go and this actually feels a little bit more natural already because um you no longer move faster on diagonals it's a lot more like circular right so even though i've only got four uh direction uh digital input Right, it, it just feels a little bit smoother. And we have, we've got Mr. Circle over here as well, making everything feel nice. Um, did I mention that I improved my Love 2D wrapper so that it, it ran things really like naturally? Maybe I didn't even like, just like Stone Cold didn't mention that. Um, the Love 2D layer has improved. So runs in Love 2D, runs on a play, in a PlayStation 2 emulator, also runs uh, pretty much exactly like this on hardware. I haven't verified this exact uh, build, but I, I guarantee you, with all the testing I've done, this works on hardware. Cool, so. Now, the next thing uh, to make this a little bit smarter is gonna be for the play to actually have a kind of a velocity, I guess, frame to frame. So let's say a VX equals zero and a VY, which is gonna default to zero. Um, and now when we move, it's gonna. So this is going to be a walk speed. Let's have a walk excel as well. And our walk acceleration, we're going to accelerate at, this is always hard to get right. Let's just say like 80 for now. 80 pixels per frame, uh, pixels per second per second, right? Pixels per pp, pp2. Um, hopefully. So now rather than updating our x, uh, we update our vx. So self.vx equals 
self dot vx plus move dot x times dt. And now rather than uh, walk, this is walk excel. So we're now accelerating, uh, which is... Okay, so here's the thing. Do we... We multiply... I'm always confused when... If you just have a speed, it's really easy to go, okay, well, this is our speed. We multiply um, our speed by the delta time. But do you multiply acceleration by delta time as well? I guess... Is that too many multiplications by time? Let's just multiply by time for now. And, and this is no longer move, by the way. This is now our acceleration. Uh, a very different thing, right? We're doing, we're doing calculus. Okay, so... Uh, 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 does this x, y? Sure. One of these days I'm going to learn the Vim command to um, clear a search, but today is not that day. Okay, so we accelerate, and now we just come down here and say self.x equals self.x plus self.vx, and then do the same thing for y. Um, and now if I run this, I'm going to get some pretty crazy results, right? We, we go to the freaking moon. Uh, because there's no cap. So now instead of this, we have to say math.max, math.min. Uh, so whichever is smaller between our walk speed and what we're accelerating to. Um, but also, this only works if we're accelerating to the right or down. This won't work for left or up because uh, we're, we're only like doing this this min. So let me demonstrate. Uh, let, let me... Hold on, I think, I think I missed a DT. Yeah, there we go. So we're capped to the left. We're not capped to the right. I don't know if that's very obvious to see. Um, this this needs to be much much higher. <laughs> God, it's like we're ice skating. Um, it, because a there's no friction, but it's also it's taking a very long time to get up to speed. And then yeah, I think it was a bit more obvious there that there's okay. So if uh, self dot uh, sorry if excel dot x less than zero uh, but I'm trying to write Python here and then we do the okay so so we've got a I'm pretty sure an if I guess we could just like kind of say clamp range I guess that kind of works as well it's the same thing um So clamp, uh, clamp this value from negative self dot walk to self dot walk. Right. So clamp our speed in each direction to. Uh, oh, but now we can. Hmm. I think this is interesting because now we're actually hitting the same diagonal problem again, right? We're gonna we can move faster in diagonals because our maximum speed on each axis is the same. I don't know. Let's let's just see how this feels. Um, <laughs> let's. Just, I I think the acceleration direction is a more important one. So we need this like clamp f function, uh, which isn't hard to implement. Uh, v min max. So we want to say if v less than min, then return min. Else, if v greater than max, greater than equal to max, then return max. Else, return v end. And this is else if. Uh, I don't think it really matters less than versus less than equal. Cool. So if I run this now, we're now bound in every direction. But this is this is still pretty gross. Um, feels not great. And we also need... So if our move length is greater than zero, else, 
uh, if our move length is zero, then we just kind of like apply friction, right? So self dot v y equals move. How do we want to say this? Moving towards zero is actually, uh, or moving towards, you know, like making sure it actually like gets smaller but doesn't like cross zero, right? We want to move towards zero. Uh, if we're moving to zero from above, we want to make sure that we don't go below zero. If we're moving to zero from below, we want to make sure we don't go above zero. Uh, again, we can kind of split this logic out into like for vx and vy greater than zero or less than zero. Uh, I think that's probably a smarter way. The smart smart ways don't uh, don't win prizes. Let's say move to zero. Uh, Subtract the x, and we're going to have a friction value of self dot friction, because because that's good. Uh, move to zero, self dot vy. We need to define move to zero. We need to define our friction. Let's give ourselves a friction of 200 as well. And it's actually going to be friction times delta t, I believe. Maybe. Um, I really don't know. I don't know what unit our acceleration and, and friction and stuff are in. That's really not the best. Um, okay. Okay. So. I'm going to play a... Move to zero. V D. So if V is greater than zero, then uh, we want to return. So if we subtract D from V, we want to return uh, zero. We want to return whichever is bigger, V minus D or zero. So math, return math dot max zero V minus D, right? So we're moving towards zero. If we cross zero, we just return zero because zero will be bigger. Like if v minus d is negative, then zero is bigger. Else we do, uh, else if v less than zero, then return math dot min v plus d, right? Similar idea. If we cross, uh, we just we just return zero. Else return v. Or else return zero, right? It, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it doesn't matter, right? So now, um, we end. Now we we try and remember to run Lua Lint because that's going to give us nicer error messages. And we now decelerate. Uh, unfortunately, we also accelerate like a sack of bricks. <laughs> this is slow. This is slow. Uh, this is cool, right? Like this is this is like playing a nice level in uh, a link to the past. <laughs> You also get a fair bit of speed on you. Okay, so our walk acceleration needs to be much higher. Let's set it to 800 and see what happens. I, like I said, I don't know what units these are in. Um, this is, there's something weird going on here. There's something very weird going on here. What did, okay, it's time to refer to player.thernal. I'm pretty sure I have acceleration, right? Yeah, I accelerate to. Ah, yeah, this was this was good, right? Um, accelerate from some number to a target, but if your if t is greater than oh man, this was this was like really messy logic. Um, also, I think player uses its own little vector library because I hadn't hadn't implemented the standard one yet that the other entities use. This game jam was a mess, let me tell you. Uh, is for for Zvil, uh, making a game in Lua, making a game that runs on a PlayStation Two in Lua, and porting the logic from my Lisp game jam failed entry. Uh, yeah, a lot of moving parts in that sentence. Uh, also, are the fours in your name fours or letter A's? Uh, I'm I'm like searching for a vowel. <laughs> um. Okay, so that's right. Update stand. This is where all my like movement logic happened, right? So I had a wish direction. I normalized the wish direction. Uh, I got my delta. 
Yeah, so the I guess the important difference here versus what I'm doing in my Lua code is that this just outright sets uh, VX and VY, right? We don't even mess around. We don't accelerate... We, yeah, we don't accelerate to a speed. We just are a speed. Um, the speed... It's all a state of mind. Um, yeah, let's just... Okay. I'm like, why does this not feel as good? It doesn't feel as good because I was uh, overcomplicating it. How is the process to port Lua code to PS2? Um, it actually, it just runs. So I've got uh, kind of like a little, you know, a fairly minimal C program that provides pretty much the basics, like the barest uh, interface you need to interact with PlayStation 2 hardware. And uh, I'm writing all of the graphics in Lua. So what that means is I've basically got the slowest, least efficient PlayStation 2 engine ever created. But what's cool about it is, even if you're not like a weird C memory bit pattern expert, you can open this up, you can have a look at Draw2D, right? Um, you can see really easily how I'm building these PlayStation 2 draw commands. And when I say really easily, it's, it's messy and it does require some of this kind of like domain specific knowledge. But you can, once you understand how PlayStation 2 graphics works, you can kind of see how I'm like just building buffers that set registers and then I, I kick those off to the PlayStation 2. So my goal eventually is to use this library as a teaching tool to show people how to essentially build this library from these basic PlayStation 2 graphics primitives. Um, but that's a work in progress. I'm kind of like thinking about how I'm going to do it and I'm thinking about how I'm going to script it. And I thought, you know, what better way to really get that into my head than to try and build something uh, out of, you know, kind of like the, the library. So yeah, there's a lot there's a lot going on uh, right now. And this, this stream is like a small fragment of a lot of things I'm thinking about. <laughs> um, okay, so... We are we are simplifying. Um, I think what I think it is important though that we refactor this slightly so that rather than updating self.x here, we're updating this velocity because this means that other things can change or play with our velocity, um, and it means that you know we kind of get this friction and stuff, and then we just apply our speed at the end. Uh, C, yeah, no, I really love C as well. Um, C is good when programs are small, but like. Every larger C code base I've read kind of feels like it becomes a small language within C, right? Like it kind of extends C, you get all these weird macros and stuff that do weird cool things, which is great, but it becomes hard to read, right? Um, yeah, no, like I, I love hacking together small C programs. I think it can actually be really elegant and really beautiful. And yeah, you're you're doing well to stay away from GUI programming or like anything with graphics, unless you're using like SDL or doing some nice simple OpenGL stuff. Uh, if you're doing like actual proper like GUI stuff in C, absolute nightmare. Uh, cool. So now when I run this, oh dear, uh, oh dear, <laughs> oh move dot x, move dot y, that explains it. Okay, that feels good now. That feels that feels like proper top-down 2D movement. Let's just run it in the PlayStation 2 emulator to be sure. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. So we've basically ported that across. Um, let's just quickly commit it. Vector math. Cool. Um... So now let's let's uh, do the flag for like if the player is actually attacking, right? Let's let's add this back in from the state it was in in the Lisp game jam. I, again, I want this to be a little bit more flexible, but we'll get it working simply for now. Uh, else, if ev key. Um, we probably want some kind of, like, action debounce as well. Uh, you could burn the binary to a disk and run it on a real PlayStation 2. Now, this is unfortunately, uh, a, a sore spot for me. So, 
in my make files, I have the capacity to build an ISO with this binary and the Lua script on it that in theory should run on a PlayStation 2. I have not actually got the ISO distribution running on a PlayStation 2 yet. I have been able to load it from other homebrew launches. My goal is eventually to be able to package things onto a disc. Um, I think that's the most fun and the most PS2-y distribution method. Not quite there yet. There are a few extra hurdles uh, for using discs well but you can put this on a usb and uh, run it if you have like a free mcboot card on your playstation 2 um yeah it, it runs on real hardware and i verified that my my lisp game jam entry did run on real hardware uh, action d bounce we're gonna have just like a little uh variable here that stores the last time well like, that, that stores if it's okay to do an action again right so let's say if self dot action d bounce greater than zero, then self dot action d bounce equals self dot action d bounce minus d t. Really great thing about having d t in seconds here uh, is that it's really simple to just like reason about what a, a d bounce time means. What about doing all this coding on the actual Linux release on the PS2? That would be a nightmare. Um, I've never actually played with PS2 Linux, I should. There there are a few people who have, like, uh, I think it's called Black Rhino Linux, right? Uh, let me... Black Rhino Linux PS2. I, I think... I can't remember what kernel version they've got running now. Um, but yeah, people have been improving it. People have been improving it. Uh, but yeah, I, that would be a fun stream one day as well. <laughs> I can't remember. Someone ported this to a more recent kernel recently, um, which is really cool. <laughs> but yeah, PS2 Linux would be cool to play with. Um, I also don't actually... I, I need a fat PS2 with a hard drive. Uh, that's that's the goal. And then I can like play with that stuff a little bit more. Self dot action d bounce less than or equal to zero cool so so we just set up like a little counter so that we don't uh double tap actions too often so we just say self dot action d bounce is 0 0.09 or something right some some tiny fraction of a second just so we can't spam it too quickly hopefully um okay so we're gonna say if uh, do action, then we need to spawn something into our state. Uh, oh, by the way, you use DDLE on your desktop. Um, on your laptop, manage. Uh, on your laptop to manage multiple monitors, you use a little script. Okay, so yeah, in chat asking about uh, managing multiple monitors with DWM, I actually run into this a bit with my laptop. I've also got a laptop running DWM. That's what I'm reading chat off of. Um, oh, actually, I need to quickly check. Yeah, cool. Um, I have a very minimal DWM setup. So I just had to like swap to a different screen and run my get battery command in the terminal to check my battery usage. Uh, I don't have it in my in my bar or anything. Uh, when I plug my laptop into my TV, I open a terminal and type xranda output HDMI 1 mode 1366 by 768 same as EDP1. I type that out every single time I want to use my laptop on my TV. And then when I unplug it, I open a terminal and type xranda HDMI uh, xranda output HDMI 1 off every time. I mean, it's like it's like a line, right? Like, uh, if you're using DWM, you must be doing a fair bit of terminal stuff, I, I would guess. I don't know. I don't mind it too much. Uh, a GUI for it wouldn't be terrible. I wouldn't complain, but I've not felt the need uh, to really need it. What, what would be nice is if it could, like, auto-detect, but I think that's, like, a lot to ask for multiple monitor setups on Linux with any um, any window manager, right? So yeah, I don't know. I'm weird. I like typing <laughs> things out. It's a bit annoying sometimes. I'll like plug it in and then realize I haven't done it and have to like get up out of my chair and whatever. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's my <laughs> strategy for managing DWM. Uh, maybe not. A D menu script to manage monitors? That would be kind of cool. Like if I could open, well, I mean, I've got Rofi, but like D menu with a list of like predetermined monitors that you could like it if you select one it toggles it on or off or something 
Um, but yeah, whenever I plug my laptop into anything, I also tend to just be mirroring the screen rather than having it left of or right of. So I think that also makes it a little bit easier to manage, a little bit easier to reason about what I want when I plug it in. Um, but yeah, it, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's a problem that I would like to solve one day, but I haven't found a solution that I like, so I just keep typing things out. Okay, so I found a problem, and that problem is, I don't know how I, oh no, hold on, I think I'm ST. This is the state, right? Yeah, okay. I was about to say I don't know how I spawn something into our state, but we actually pass the state in. So game.lua, uh, I have a spawn function, right? Yeah, game.spawn, okay, here we go, here we go. So if do action, we say uh, ST spawn, uh, where game.lua, uh, no, that's not what I want. I want main.lua. Yeah, let's go. Entity instance. Okay. So we need to make a uh, entity class for a player bullet, and we also need to work out which way the player is facing so that we know what speed to give this bullet. Um, so when we, when we, I guess we can do it based on our impulse, right? So if impulse, oh no, we need to do it every frame based on our impulse, we need to update if our move length is greater than zero. So if, hmm, how did I do it? How did I do it before? Um, I did it based on the last button pressed, right? Hmm. Okay, well, let's maybe do it the dumb way for now, and if it sucks, we'll improve it later. So we need to give ourselves direction, uh, local dear left. up cool uh sure so we'll go we'll start facing down because that'll be the default player sprite direction i think um if we press left then self dot dear equals dear left self dot dear equals dear actually do you know what might be better than defining our own constants for this. What if we just reuse the pad constant? So what if we say self dear it was pad dot left? Is this is this ambitious? Yes. I just think this is nicer, right? Because then other things can understand what our direction means. We don't end up with another arcane constant. I don't think there's any I don't think there's any downside to this. Right? I don't think it like takes away from flexibility. I think this is fine. I think this is awesome. Uh, so. Okay. 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 Here we go. So we've got a direction. Um, so let's, before we spawn, before we spawn, let's say local. Um. Uh, And we'll, yeah, okay. So we're going to make an instance. We're not going to set the X, Y, uh, or speed yet, because we need to determine that based on, based on the player's direction. So I guess either we, it, do, it doesn't matter. So now we say if dear, uh, if self dot dear equals, did I, did I say self dot dear all these times? Is that a moment of self-doubt? Good, I, I did, I did. If self.dear is pad.left, then... So if our direction is left, then proj... The, the, okay, this variable name is too long. That's going to give me RSI. The x equals self.x minus 4, and proj.y equals self.y plus self. 
uh, self dot height divided by two. And then proj dot vx equals negative 400, maybe? That sounds okay. Um, if self dot dear equals pad dot right, then Uh, plus self dot w plus four right because we want it to come from outside of our player's hitbox basically proj dot y equals self dot uh, then we want to do the same thing here but uh We're going to do the same thing again, but for up and down. So up, then, uh, and then for x, we want x plus self dot width divided by 2, and vy is going to be minus 400, and then for pad down, uh, again, it's going to be a similar thing. The y is going to be y plus height plus 4. I, I, sadly, I don't think I can self and replace this as easily it just feels a little bit more manual because of like the the extra fields here. okay cool uh, and then this needs to be an else if and maybe we need like a default case here maybe not uh maybe not so then we say state spawn we spawn the projectile we we could actually do that up here as well um but I like, I kind of like the look of this better. We make the thing, we set some things in the thing, then we spawn the thing into our scene. Uh, you don't know Lua, how do I manage memory on the PlayStation 2 to be sure the game isn't too heavy for it? Very relaxed approach to that for now. PlayStation 2 has 32 megs of RAM, uh, system RAM, like CPU RAM. Uh, we're not going to hit that in a hurry with a simple 2D Lua game, so I'm pretty, like, loose with it. Uh, I could be checking. The PlayStation 2 is weird, right? Because it's basically an embedded system. You can just pick an address that is a valid memory address and do anything you want with it. You don't have to worry about, like, an operating system telling you, no, that address is protected. Um, there is a memory mapper, which I think can be played around with, but, um, yeah, it's, it's very flexible with how you approach memory. So... Uh, you can you can just go. You can just go, right? There's no operating system to fight you for ownership of anything. Uh, all of memory is under your control while your program's running. When it comes to VRAM, things get more interesting because VRAM is very constrained. There's four megs of VRAM. About half of that gets taken up double buffering at 480p. So two megs of VRAM to load in textures. Uh, it's not enough to draw anything particularly complicated. So uh, managing VRAM mem memory is really hard, you need to upload textures mid-frame because there's a lot of bandwidth to and from the graphic synthesizer, but yeah, a, a really constrained VRAM. I think 4 megs of VRAM and 9.6 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. Uh, so managing VRAM mid-frame is hard, managing PS2 memory, I don't know, you, you just like make sure that your like levels fit, right? If you're doing complicated open world stuff, then yeah, you need to worry about allocating and freeing and, and where stuff fits in. But, you know, simple games, I, you're not going to hit a memory constraint unless you design something uh, poorly from the start, I don't think. Cool. Okay. I'm going to implement this entity. We're going to see it spawn. It's going to be beautiful. Um, I guess maybe we should... Yeah, okay, so let's go. Script player bullet.lua we'll just call it pb um, and then it, it needs a draw and update function as well so function pb update oh it needs a life as well hey uh, what, what should the lifetime of our bullet be let's say maybe 0.2 seconds. We want these to be quite short lifetime, we want these to be quite short range. Uh, so, pb update. Um, every update we say self.x equals self uh, dt. Self.x plus self.vx times dt, and then we do the same thing 
for y. We do the same thing for, oh no, <laughs> we do the same thing for all our y's. Um, and we say life equals life minus dt if life self self dot life if self dot life is less than zero then we have to die somehow uh how do we what does this look like do we ever have we considered this in our main loop i don't think we have hmm so how do we tell the game to no longer have us um Hmm. <laughs> Maybe... Okay. So let's keep a list of um, entities to delete, I guess. If e dot dead remove. Uh, so we don't want to remove things mid-iteration. I don't think that's good, right? Uh, even if Lua is okay with it, it's pretty ugly. So then... What we want to do, we have a list of table indexes that we want to remove, and we need to remove them in reverse order, because that way then the indices are still, like, the same. Uh, so let's do that before we do collisions, right? Trim trim dead entities before collisions, uh, otherwise you're just wasting space. So update, if I'm dead, then for... Um, I need to do reverse iteration, Lua reverse... Iteration. I might just have to do this with a for loop, I guess. Um, yeah, cool. Okay. For uh, i equals 1, i equals length d list i greater than 1 decreasing or d list minus 1, 1, minus 1, 0, minus 1, I think. Is this going to be okay? Maybe. Um, let's go local di equals d list i. And then... Actually, no, let's, let's just iterate forwards. Hold on, what am I... I'm being very silly. So i is 0, i is less than the length of the list, i increases by 1, um, minus i. Oh yeah, and it's one index, so this is fine, this is fine. Um, is it? Is this? I don't know, anyway. Here's my solution. A uh, good bit of debug printing. Okay, so, 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 so. Uh, so, so, so table dot remove uh, self dot e list di I think okay let's see if that works let's see if that works and then function PB draw dt or not um i think draw takes a camera now right yeah we, we every entity kind of has to manually account for the camera which i don't really like but we'll survive uh set color what color should we make this maybe like a nice healthy red and then a little bit semi-transparent just for a bit of fun, d2, d, rect, uh, we're going to do a rect at self dot x, self dot y, self dot width, self dot height, and we need to define that width and height, so let's say width is 6, height is 6, 
I don't know, nice little square. Um, we're spawning this in the center of the player, which actually isn't good. We want to spawn it at the center minus half of this thing's width and height. Ah, well, it'll do for now. It'll do for now. Uh, return PB, I guess, right? Because this is what we do with the player. Yeah. So now when we go into main dot lure, where we start defining things, we want to player bullet. And then when we come and define some uh, some entity classes, Okay, uh, there was one thing I missed, and that is including draw 2D here. So, local. So, if I run this. <laughs> there we go. Uh, that is because I didn't include entity here. Let's also just do a quick lure lint. That all looks fine. So, when we run this. Nice. My movement's gotten very... Yeah, that, that deceleration is super floaty. We've... Okay, okay, okay. But... Hmm, and we can... We can just hold that and get a bit of spam going. Um... Okay, hold on. Something... Something really strange is happening with down, um, but they get they get cleaned up. Okay, that's that's what we want to see. So if we go back to game, let's get rid of this this print for now. I suspect we may have to revisit this. Um, <laughs> may have to revisit this. So what happens when we're facing down? Something odd. Uh, y equals self y plus self height plus four. X equals x plus self width divided by two. That makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? So let's try this out in the PS2 emulator. Wow, we really... Oh yeah, that, that friction is is odd. Nice, and it, it shoots out. You can see transparency doesn't quite look the same on the PlayStation 2 yet. Uh, that is, I believe, a single flag that I'm just not setting correctly. But we can we can fire away. I probably need to make sure that this doesn't work when you just hold the button down and, and go back to the like per press system that I had in my uh, game jam entry. But this is cool. A couple of collisions and this is going to start looking more and more like a game. Um, okay, awesome, awesome. Um, what was what was the easy win? I just had an easy win in mind. I just had a really easy win. That was the okay. Well, first let's commit. Let's commit. Uh, this is the friction, right? Why does our friction seem to only apply in one direction? Right? It appears... Vx equals move to zero. It just, it feels like our friction in one direction... Oh! Oh, I've got it. So... So... Hmm... Our friction is applied a bit because we just like override our velocity x and velocity y because the last thing before we like start applying friction is usually just holding left or right so we'll be moving in a diagonal but then we don't release the keys at the same time so if left is held just a little bit longer we end up just moving left so then we uh, only get we only decelerate to the left right so basically I have to crank this friction number up and then say that this is a bug to fix later. <laughs> Um, this, because this is not going to get fixed right now. Yeah, it, it just feels very unnatural when that happens. Um, so next thing on the list is going to be collision and that is going to be a topic for another night. Um, really excited to build my function based composable, uh, 
uh, collision system. That's gonna be that's gonna be really fantastic. We've actually got a, a few people hanging around in chat at the moment as well, by the way. So I might direct you over in some kind of raid. I'm not sure uh, not sure who I should raid. Any of you guys got thoughts on cool people uh, who are streaming at the moment who we can chuck a couple of viewers over to? I'm just gonna have a quick look at science and technology. Oh man, my my like suggested channels are fantastic right now. Um, who have we got? Is is there anyone doing like weird homebrew game dev at the moment? <laughs> That'd be a good one to host. That'd be a good one to uh, to raid rather. I don't know. Is a raid worth it with five people? What are we feeling, guys? What are we feeling? Not many people in science and tech at the moment, actually. Alright, well I'm not I'm not seeing a lot in science and technology at the moment, so I might leave it there. But uh Yeah, I'll I have got I gotta find a few people that I have on my list that I know I can now host. Thank you everyone who tuned in and uh thank you of course to everyone who's watching this on YouTube after the fact. Because I get views and it continues to blow my mind. So this was cool. We got some stuff running. Hold on, I should I should really just like I should really just like Just for for the sake of like, you know, a, a decent sign off, right? we've got we've got something running we're we're pointing things over we're pointing things over it's a bit slower than i hoped but we're getting there uh so thank you very much for tuning in i'll be uh sure to be back soon doing more of this i've got i've got the bug i'm seeing things come together now it's going to be better than the lisp version by uh an absolute mile thank you again and i'm starting to ramble so i'm going to cut the stream there i'm tom i'll catch you next time